Hello, everybody. How are you all doing on this fine Monday afternoon? Hopefully, we've caught some of you guys perhaps on your way home from work after a wonderful, productive uh, day at the office. Mm. Um, <laughs> I know that's what these guys had, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Every Monday. Quick time, a little uh, productivity. There you go. Um, welcome to Bring the Jury. This is a true crime podcast hosted by two criminal defense attorneys. They are also twins. Boom! Um, bonus points. Um, and my name's Hannah. I'm just, I'm here um, to help facilitate conversation. Um, <laughs> you can always catch us And keep on... us grounded. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. To reel us back in. We can have three lawyers in a pod. That'd be stupid. That'd yeah. Be stupid pod. Yeah, that'd be, that'd be stupid pod. Um, but anyway, so you can always catch us uh, during our lives here on TikTok. If you miss any parts of this episode and want to listen to the full episode, you can always check us out on YouTube or pretty much any streaming service that you have access to if you just want the audio as well. Um, this following week, all those will be shared. You can find those on the Sheely Law YouTube page, just Sheely Law, so check that out. Um, we're also on Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook, all the places that you may may socially media uh, yourself. So MySpace. MySpace. We are not on MySpace, but would I be on? I'd be on the top. I'd be number one top friend on MySpace <laughs> if they did have one. Um, shout out to all the millennials out there. Um, all right, well, we're just going to go ahead and dive right in. I think I've said enough. We are talking about the Idaho Four tonight. Um, and we have, in recent episodes, been heavily focusing on Brian Koberger. However, tonight I think we're going to take a little shift. Um, last episode, we had a lot of people chime in about their suspicions with Emma Bailey um, and just other interesting updates. And always, if you have any questions, please feel free to drop them below and I will uh, relay those to these guys. Yeah, so what's up with Emma Bailey? I mean, this case is fascinating. Well, because it's one of those no motive cases, right? And so law enforcement has put, you know, and it's also under a, a pretty big protective order. There hasn't been a lot of media um, crumbs to pick off of here. There's a, a giant preliminary hearing that we've covered in a lot of our pods, um, a lot of our episodes that's scheduled for June 26. But so everyone's been very fascinated by this case and mostly because it's, you know, a no motive case, a stranger case. It's a mass murder, um, four, four killing case of roommates. And Brian Koberger is kind of a unique kind of guy with his background, you know, in criminology. He's a PhD student. He, uh, you know, has applied to work in law enforcement. He's researched various articles and studying, you know, kind of interesting cases about, you know, how to commit crime and kind of the emotional response you need and how that shapes when you kill people. So he's kind of this uh, movie star type villain on paper. Mm -hmm. But, you know, he says he looks forward to his day in court. His lawyer says that we can't wait to prove his innocence, even though he's presumed innocent. And uh, the whole country is kind of fascinated by this case. Yeah. So Emma Bailey came up a good bit in the last episode. And I, and I will just say... We are going to dive into Emma. You know, it's, at this point, it's pretty speculative um, in terms of links to anything having to do to her. But what we will reveal is that maybe there are some connections, local connections that you can kind of sink your teeth into a little bit. We'll try to pull on the string a little bit. I will say one thing we haven't covered yet on Mr. Coburger is that apparently, you know, his, Luke said, likes to say it this way, sometimes the lack of evidence is the evidence. We get that kind of law enforcement theory a good bit. You know, he, he had his cell phone turned off, um, which is suspicious if you're charging him with murder. If you're not charging him with murder um, and you can't prove he was in the area, then you would say, well, you know, he wasn't in the area. But well, we don't know that his cell phone was turned off. We just know it wasn't connected to, to the, the network. Maybe it was... On airplane mode, maybe it was it had powered down, as many people will have. But law enforcement wants to say we think he turned it off to avoid detection. Right, what, but what he's a criminologist; he knows how to do that. Now, but law enforcement is believing that he returned to the crime scene. They want to put a spin on that because 
you know, his phone did utilize quote unquote cell, cellular resources that would have provided coverage to the Kings Road residents between 9, 12 a.m. and 9, 21 a.m. that next morning. So his phone is connecting again back to cell phone provider towers. And again, the cell phone stuff, these are huge geographical triangulation coordinates. I mean, it's not like GPS pinpoint where he's back in the driveway. These are kind of large. So basically law enforcement have subpoenaed his phone records and they can see that he, his phone at least was pinging off a tower that, that could have also covered that address of the killing. So we haven't really covered that aspect, but it's just another... Again, what does it mean? Is he uh, reveling gratuitously in the crime that he committed and wants to see whether anybody's around? Is there, is there a police presence there? Are there sobbing, grieving folks? Or is there just some reason he has to be in that area, which we don't know because he hasn't really been interviewed, that would be a normal, logical pattern of his travel that's pretty routine? Don't know. But I guarantee you law enforcement with this no motive style killing, you know, they obviously they've charged him with murder, four counts, and they, they're going to be going with the you are a budding serial killer and you're going to come back to the scene of the crime for that kind of very unique gratification <laughs> that only a crazy sociopath gets your jollies off. Get, and they're gonna, they'll have some expert uh, psychological profiler come in to trial and be like, oh yeah, this guy fits the profile. Which? He's, you know, he was be sitting there staring, you know, with everyone else at, at the crime scene tape and law enforcement. And that's how he gets, you know, gratification off what he's done. It was raining. He was there in a hoodie. Oh so, yeah. Cloaked. So, Lurking. So that's, you know, what we can expect from that little bit of information um, and the defense team will have. But if we didn't have that evidence, it would be, well, he knows to stay away because that's what a smart criminal would do. Yeah, criminals don't, smart criminals don't go back to the scene and get placed in handcuffs. That would be silly. <laughs> um, we have somebody that's asking to please explain the rule against perpetuity. Perpetuities? Perpetuities? This has nothing to do with criminal law. No, we're not going to do that. <laughs> this is a, a true crime <laughs> pop. <laughs> um, if you want to know the rule against perpetuities, then go to law school. That has nothing to do with criminal law. Uh, yeah. We can... Uh, hey! That's with the lawyer. The non-lawyer. Hey! <laughs> Stop we messing have, with the non-lawyer! <laughs> we have some lawyers in the building that... Does anybody want to talk about the rule of perpetuities? Julia? I think they would. She's Silence. Silence. She's like, I'm not going out. Um, okay. So, we're, we're talking about, you know, witnesses to a case. We're not leaving. talking about rule of perpetuities. We're not talking about the rule of perpetuities. Um, <laughs> but we do have some reporting on the private driver that actually dropped off um, a couple of these roommates the night of the killing. Kaylee... Um, and also Maddie were dropped off by this private driver. Um, and of course this reporting, he's not wanting his name used, but this media source is going on to quote him. Um, Luke, what are his thoughts about things? You read this article and, and tell us about how the state could use him as a sentimental witness um, at trial. Well, law enforcement and prosecutors like to kind of, take you into the mind of a victim right before their death to kind of let you walk in their shoes, let you see that they weren't, they didn't have, they did not have this coming. They weren't doing anything other than being sweet young victims who were having a good night. And he says that they were, he knows them. He's driven them before. They were happy or lucky, never gave them any problems. He kind of has a little bit of survivor's guilt built into this. Like, I wonder if I could have done something different. You know, he can't believe that this happened in his own community. And, that, you know, he starts feeling uh, like he wants to help law enforcement. They put out naked models of, you know, the Hyundai, the white Hyundai Elantra that was in question. And so he says that he actually submitted several uh, cars that he saw in the area as a driver. And one of them was uh, Mr. Kohlberger's. So he feels like like he's a part of it. Um, we've had lots of cases where kind of critical witnesses 
almost step into the shoes of a victim by the way they feel and they they want to be a part of what they believe gets justice for a situation so it's i found it to be pretty typical he was very much wanting to distance himself from any suspicion because i think he did at least in his article claim to get some suspicion cast at him early early on being that he was one of the last people to see these young women so of course he naturally would have been interviewed by investigators so it's fairly typical he wants to be helpful he wants to be part of uh, what most folks would consider justice he He's like, man, I live very close to this guy myself once I realize. They say live 1,200 feet from right. Cobra. So it's, it's pretty typical. We've had some cases where we had uh, you know, vi- witnesses who are close to victims or even victim adjacent very much, depending on who you are, sometimes like to be really involved. You start kind of getting that attention and you really want to make sure that the world knows that you are on the side of right. There's no question about it. And you want to be, you know, it's just kind of a self-gratifying thing, which, you know, that's human nature. Yeah. I mean, he's talking about how he, you know, would pick them up. They would use his driving service. He knew where they worked. You know, they they worked at a local Greek restaurant. And he said that they were all good employees and they were friendly girls. Um, Julia is still over there texting me. She refused to come Mm -hmm. talk about the rule of perpetuities. Julia! But does she know what perpetuity is? She is smart enough that she probably does. Hey, your knowledge on that does not gauge how smart you are. And I think we have a former law professor lawyer in this room over here who probably could. I think she just ran out of the building when she, when she heard <laughs> yeah. us, she heard us uh, asking, hello, hello, anyone want to talk about perpetuity? Uh, perpetuity is the rule against. So witnesses that are you know, victim adjacent. You know, that's something that we, you know, anytime there's a murder case, you know, whether they got the right person or not, or whether it's a justified killing or not, um, because there are justified killings, self-defense, defense of others, defense of habitation, you name it, um, you know, victim adjacent witnesses do, you know, every now and then we get like shining stars that want to come to the courtroom and and be their (laughs) own story. We once had a murder case at a Waffle House. I knew you were going to talk about this guy. <laughs> Number one, Waffle House is delicious. Love it. But never go there after 10 p.m. at night. I mean, it can, because it's That's when it's the best. Well, th- things are going to get real after 10, 10, 10 p.m. Depending yeah. on what Waffle House Waffle House, please don't hate us. We love you. Oh, I love Eat Waffle Eat there all the time. It's great. It's also Mer- very clean. I, like, what I've worked are, in a lot of restaurants. What are you talking about? I, listen, the fact that you can watch your your servers put together your food and your cooks like cook your food right in front of you that's a whole different level of integrity that you don't get the the pleasure of at most other restaurants you know what's going on behind the scenes i disagree with you strongly that waffle house isn't clean because i know what i'm getting into when you get into a waffle house i mean yeah it may look all nice on the surface but if you look under those Mm -hmm. don't look those those (laughs) like uh grill tops and everything just Look underneath one day, and Dangerous you know. I mean, you know well, what you're getting. I will always eat at a Waffle House, but I will not eat there late at night. It tends to have people who are intoxicated come there to eat food late at night. I think we probably had ten murder cases at Waffle House, and oh people get rival oh folks God. who I mean, they're everywhere. We had a case where there was an incident earlier amongst a couple different parties and then they randomly happened to be at the same Waffle House and our client had to defend himself and but the, one of the Waffle House employees was like a star witness and just was so aligned with the alleged victim that he was very dramatic hammed it up embellished and I, re- I remember you got a measuring tape out in court because he was trying to say that he had basically he was on top of everything he could see everything he could see that he could see our client dripping with malice yeah and, and that he was you know I forget how you did it but what, what do you say he was so this so this close and you basically pull up measuring tape and walked it down uh, the courtroom then you like snapped the tape at him too like I didn't snap it at him but we had quite a contentious moment because he he wanted to align himself so much with the victims, even though he was just a, su- supposed to be an objective witness, and I think I brought him back to reality. 
but he wanted to help so badly. Some people just have that personality that they feed off that. So I mean, if I recall, he was trying to talk about our client, as you say, dripping with malice. And then we played the video and he was hiding behind one of the coolers <laughs> that, with his back to the well, shooting. Pretty much it, it disputed something he claimed to witness, which is that he saw our client, you know, draw down for no good reason. The victim didn't have a gun, but he was just, he was behind the counter the entire time. He saw nothing. But after the fact, he wanted to pretend like he saw every blow. So some people want to be so involved that they will embellish. It's just a, it's, it's a phenomenon, I guess. Right, right. All right, so who, why is, it, why is the world and social media interested in Emma Bailey? 22-year-old Emma Bailey of Moscow, Idaho. Why are people talking about her? Well, people are talking about her because this is a no motive killing mm -hmm. in terms of the suspect they've charged. But there was a DoorDash delivery at 4 a.m. And the killing happened shortly after that. And so everyone is very curious about who the DoorDash person was. And kind of local people have been investigating. And Emma Bailey is a local Moscow person. And apparently she did work at DoorDash. And everything's sealed all the... <clears throat> evidence right now is under a gag order and so media is kind of going crazy about her because apparently her family has confirmed or at least some semi investigative sources that she was a DoorDash driver mm -hmm. at the time of this incident and drove nights and drove nights and so you know a lot of other internet internet sleuthers are looking at crime scene photos that have been released and kind of look picking around this apparently was an order from Jack in the Box. Delicious, delicious burgers and, and various things. <laughs> Literally anything you want, I feel like Jack in the Box does it. It's a jack of all trades. Jack really. of all trades. And so people have even confirmed through Jack in the Box of a DoorDash delivery at that time and confirmed it was a young female with dark hair, mm. and which would fit the description of Emma Bailey. So. You know, as people are diving into Emma Bailey due to this DoorDash connection and the possibility of her working that night and the possibility of her um, delivering that food. Now, none of this can be, you know, verified. I mean, there are law enforcement has subpoenaed DoorDash and tons of companies, Snapchat, all social media. We're going to have all these records. TikTok. TikTok. Um, but they have not re released any of this information for people to really verify or not. So that's why there's so much internet digging. But you know, it does seem plausible that she was working that night. It's con been confirmed plausibly by her family that she worked nights. And then the Jack in the Box folks are saying that someone matching generally her description as a young Caucasian female of dark hair picked up the DoorDash order that went to that address. Um, you know, other things that people have been discussing is apparently Emma Bailey lived very close right behind this incident location um, at some point with her family or with roommates. And so people are kind of going crazy about the proximity of it all. You know, Coburger is in the proximity, um, this being a college community, this being kind of a local community where everyone's going back and forth. So apparently she lived very close by at some point. Um, per social media sleuthing, she's friends with um, a girl that used to be on the lease there, Ashlyn Couch. Mm. She's friends via Instagram. Now what does that mean? Not a whole lot. I mean, there's a lot of people that have thousands of Instagram followers. Um, and doesn't mean they're friends with them, but apparently she was friends with someone that actually was on the lease at some point at this address where the killing occurred. So if you're, if you're a nation fascinated by this case because of the lack of motive in the serial killer, you know, sociopathic kind of targeting, if you're the state regarding Brian Koberger, then this connection, whether it was just a, ra a random happenstance of a DoorDash person making a delivery and then someone like Brian Koberger coming in, okay, 
or if Koberger per his lawyer is completely innocent and just happens to be driving around this location a whole bunch before and then maybe even next morning well it's a it's a relatively small community um but the fascination with emma bailey doesn't just stop there um you know people have foiled and, and lots of body cam footage videos and incident footage of this residence where these victims lived and it was by all accounts a party house i mean there were noise violations these are college kids these are they're having a good time it's a college town and there are some people that are now that they're focusing on Emma Bailey's identity, and you know, she looks like this. We'll talk about this in a, this article in a second, but she is 22, young, Caucasian, dark, dark hair, and there's a lot of people that are pouring through body cameras of police response to this location who swear, and I've reviewed it, and I can't say it is or it isn't, but there are people that think that she went to parties at that location, in the months leading up to the killing was kind of a familiar presence. So people are kind of fascinated by that. Some of that actually would have been going there. And this is a house where people are drinking heavily. They're doing college stuff. Um, after this incident, uh, in February 12th of 2023, Emma Bailey was also pulled over for a DUI, driving under the influence in the, you know, across the way over in Washington. And so that is not crazy um, in and of itself. But again, the fascination with a killing and you start looking into their background and all of a sudden someone's picking up a DUI. Now, in our last episode, we talked a lot about Koberger's own body camera from mm -hmm. his traffic stop. And Hannah, you talked a lot about Koberger kind of being very assertive and trying to say he wasn't breaking traffic laws. Mm -hmm. And did you look at Emma's I did. body cam? I did. Do you think she's being assertive? Um, yeah, I do. I mean, she, well, perhaps untruthful at times. She had been drinking, um, so that definitely plays a part in it. But, you know, she's kind of pulling the whole, he asks, uh, you know, have you been drinking? No, no. Nope, not at all. And then, you know, he says, you know, you've been drinking some, you know, I can see your wristband, I can smell the alcohol. And she says, I had one beer. Um, and then that goes on to, you know, he's asking her, well, you ran the stoplight. And then she says, oh, it was red? Like, I thought it was yellow. Um, so perhaps she wasn't so much like, I know my rights and you can't do this. And this right, is really right, right, right. Thing. Yeah, she's trying to she, definitely she's get She's being out defensive, this. yeah, right. that she doesn't want to assume, you know. But she's no shrinking violet, that's for sure. No. Um, her eyebrows are quite bushy. Well, that's interesting, Luke. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we do have a witness that, yeah, this is, now this is kind of fun and games because, you know, all this is very serious, but the eye, eyebrow bushy comment, you know, one of the roommates is describing who she believes to be a slender but athletic male covered from head to toe with a black mask and black outfit who has bushy eyebrows. Um, so Luke, you, you think Emma has bushy eyebrows? Oh, just my powers of observation seem to reflect that, but it's just a salient point. If I'm a lawyer trying to think of theories of defense. So the DUI in and of itself is not, not super interesting, but it, you know, people that get alcohol related offenses and things, and then later drug offenses, as we'll talk about, at a young age, sometimes it's because they're kind of getting over their head, um, or as Luke likes to say, out over their skis, maybe person, their personal life and that kind of thing. And so, but she does, she does blow 0.18 on this DUI case. Um, you know, she's trying to get out, she's trying to diminish a traffic violation. The cops are being super nice. Um, she, I think on the third attempt at blowing into the two, reg finally registers a sample. And so it, the cop's kind of insinuating initially that maybe she needs to blow a little harder and that, you know, we do DUI work too. And sometimes our clients are not like super enthusiastic about blowing and maybe they think they can kind of blow a little short, unsustained breath and that'll <laughs> kind of give it the old college try, but not really give a sample. And so I don't know if that's what Emma's thinking, but you know, she does catch this DUI case. Um, but what is 
more significant mm -hmm. is that um, later on, in just the next month, um, in March, she is arrested and charged along with an older guy, um, Demetrius Robinson, who's 36 years old from Tacoma, Washington. You know, they are charged in the drug possession, essentially of fentanyl, mm -hmm. that led to the overdose death of a young college student at a party um, right south of Seattle. And so she's been charged along with this older guy. Um, both are being held at $100,000 bail. They are still, both are still in jail. This is in Lewis County, Seattle. Um, and, you know, it's one of those things that I don't know who this older guy is, but, you know, we do enough serious criminal defense work to know that, you know, if you're trying to think about motive, now, drug dealers go into houses all the time. And if Emma is a DoorDash delivery person, well, that's a way to get around pretty quickly throughout campus, throughout town. town. Here's your jack-in-the-box with a side of fentanyl. Without yeah. Fish. Oh, my God. <laughs> so, but like, now drug dealers, if they ever get shorted on payment, on the terms that they're expecting, now that's a motive. And we've had plenty of cases where drug dealers can be extremely violent um, when they're not happy about the terms of their payment arrangement. Um, so she, you know, has some kind of connection to this older guy, Demetrius Robinson. He's got a lengthy criminal record for, you know, some violence and drugs. He's got the same bond conditions. Um, they're both locked up right now. Um, Hannah, you were mentioning that you were saying their court date was today. Mm -hmm. May 15th. And it actually looks like it was today, but then it got continued. Uh. Um, cancel reason, it says stricken. I don't know if that means you're stricken with uh, nervousness about going to court <laughs> or, you're, or you're like sick, stricken. Mm -hmm. um, and it looks like... Well, the reason is not available. Yeah, but it looks like the jury trial date has now been rescheduled for May 22nd. Uh, you know, these court dates, some states are way better at really keeping uh, people to the court dates and there's actually going to be a jury trial. But this, both of them, both Emma and Demetrius Robinson, and these charges carry 10 years, they're felony allegations. They're pretty serious. Um, and anytime you have a case where there's, even though they're not charged with like a murder, I mean, some states have, you know, statutory abilities to charge someone with an overdose murder and some states don't um so they're not charged with murder as a, you know by giving drugs but it's all the link is there so any kind of um trial or bond settings or anything like that would have this this overdose victim's family notified and present and be pretty tough to get bond right luke that's correct right and apparently the white elantra um, the, her boyfriend, or I guess they're saying that maybe it's her boyfriend, but Demetrius's brother drives. Uh, oh, oh, really? Uh, oh, really? The plot thickens. But, yeah. so... <laughs> Could be total coincidence, but it does seem very suspicious that all this was happening <clears throat> within, I mean, moments you know, of each other. Yeah. You know, so and that's, that's why... We talked in prior episodes about wanting to know how many white Hyundai Elantras did law enforcement look at, and, and you got this uh, private driver who drove those girls home who turned in Kohlberger's, but like, how many did they have? Did they have a hundred that matched? And then what keeps them in the circle of suspicion at that point? Well, if I were law enforcement, based on this, that would keep at least some circle of suspicion, but... So we've got this whole DoorDash situation playing out with potentially Emma Bailey, who used to live right around the corner, who does work or did work at DoorDash mm -hmm. and matches the description of the DoorDash driver that picked up the Jack in the Box, who now has been arrested and has been linked to a much older male 
based on his drug and criminal record, looks like he could be very well be a drug dealer. And so let's say you're running drugs for this guy and we have these victims surely like to party and you know, young people like to party. Fentanyl is pervasive in America right now. It's being mixed with cocaine. cocaine. It's being mixed with other drugs. People are dying left and right. Um, it is just crazy. It's, it's super, super powerful, way more powerful than most anything that's available on the street. And so it's getting into everything, making drug dealers a lot of money. Um, but we talk about motive to do something. Maybe there's a motive there. Um, and again, we have this victim living witness who has been subpoenaed initially by the defense team, but now has apparently been willing uh, to give a, a statement to the defense team about something that she saw the night of this killing that they believe is going to really help establish the innocence of their client for this June 26 preliminary hearing. Maybe it has to do with a door dash driver. Maybe it has to do with a drug deal situation. We just don't know. Um, but we'll say this motive is not required in almost any murder criminal statute on the books anywhere. You don't need motive. Um, murder is typically just the unlawful killing of another with malice, a forethought. But everyone, and including law enforcement, is always driving to look for motive because it's much more likely in an easier case to prosecute someone with motive with an axe to grind that would do something terrible versus just a random, perfectly shaped uh, Hollywood type serial killer. That's kind of far-fetched. I mean, they, they exist. <laughs> They're, they're there, but, you know, they're not as the commonplace. They're kind of the unicorn uh, killer allegation. So, Do we know if Emma was a student? I think she was a student at some point. Um, I don't know currently. I, we haven't looked into that angle, but, you know, she was friends with some of the, at least one of the people mm -hmm. on the lease. Um I was looking at her Instagram today and I see her traveling all, everywhere, Hawaii, Chicago, California. I mean, she was, it seemed like she was trying to be like a, you know, she was trying to do some modeling. It seemed like she was kind of trying to be a, an influencer. An influencer. Travel influencer. I, didn't, I didn't see a whole lot about studying for finals. Okay. Okay. Um, I see. The only reason why I ask is I do and this is no slight to University of Idaho, but I do feel as though, you know, colleges like this, when something bad happens, they're very quick to hush hush and figure out a way to kind of divert this attention, negative attention from their university because enrollments equal money. And, you know, if you have something like this that has happened amongst your students, I mean, that's, that, that's not good. And, I don't know. I, I know that there are some even university officials who are now working for the, um, the well, I guess it's not the state. Who's trying the case? Yeah. yeah. Oh, it is the state. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. you know, so now they've hired university officials, which, which seems, I mean, maybe, maybe it is, you know, just a small, small pool to pull from, but just a few things that seem, I don't know. Yeah, any kind of campus killing, campus tragedy, I mean... Universities, like you said, are always trying to distance themselves from being one of our own if they can. It, it's their spin would much rather be it as like a one-off kind of outsider doing something terrible to our students versus a student doing something bad to one of our own. Um, it's weird because you can't, especially on a large campus, you can't like control people. You can't prevent yeah. bad things from happening because you know these major universities are like they're little towns within mm -hmm. a, a region or a metropolitan region so it's you can't really you know legislate for that but you certainly can PR yeah. spin it mm -hmm. and that's exactly what they're trying to do I mean, it's optics is what it's all about for lots of industries and employers like I notice every time we let's say sue a police officer who hasn't than doing things by the book. Like, I'll, I'm very attracted to articles about cops, and they'll say, former police officer, blah, 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 blah. And so I, then I click in the article, and I'm like, 
thinking he was like a former police officer like in a past life or like two years ago and it's like no <laughs> yesterday when we fired you he's <laughs> now former because he sold drugs out of the evidence locker but that's because he, he just got arrested so now he's former okay well the, the title is always like former police officer charged with blah 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 and that's simply because law enforcement's uh, s- social media or media team have right. sent a little a little blurb to right. a local press and that's the headline right. and guess what the guy or the lady is not employed there anymore because they fired him <laughs> because they they got they caught a charge so it's just it's all about optics and so if, if, if she had ties to school I'm sure that would be buried just like anything bad because um, n- yeah now is the time to start thinking about cutting tuition checks mommies and daddies it's time to start paying for your kids uh, education and you know the Idaho 4 and this horrific mass murder we are driving up prices of that school right now uh, just by talking about uh, it oh man um, we'll wait till this uh, prelim occurs they're gonna have to uh, reduce their tuition because there's gonna be all kinds of stuff going on about it um, but you know if something comes out of this prelim that does lean towards you know especially with this living victim some kind of witness identification of someone else entering the home, whether it's a drug dealer component that has nothing to do with DoorDash or it's a DoorDash front for potentially someone that's helping a drug dealer, you know, deliver drugs. Mm-hmm. Um, what the defense team will be trying to do is what's called a third party guilt case. And those are rare. Those are kind of the unicorns, uh, can be the unicorns of the defense, any defense team on a murder case. We tried them before defense, you know, third party guilt cases and made some, some waves. Um, but Luke, how does a third party guilt case work? How, what's the, what are the mechanics of a third party guilt case? What does that even mean? Third party guilt <laughs> Well, it just simply it means you're blaming somebody else. But you, most jurisdictions, don't want you to just scatter shot randomly pull something out of your butt and say, "Hey, it was so and so, not my guy." I mean, you have to have some Substance. credible evidence, you know, depending on the case law, to have a threshold to establish it. And at least in South Carolina, that's kind of where we're at. You can't just say, well, I'm pretty sure I bet it was this guy. No, you have to have witnesses. You have to have some thing to point that out. And it's even better if you can point that out with that evidence and point out how maybe law enforcement had it in front of them the the entire time and then they missed it. Uh, We once had a pretty famous local murder case where... Law, a mother was killed on Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day, everybody. And they arrested the wa- the husband and prosecuted him and used a kind of star witness who was a friend, a mutual friend, as an eyewitness. And that was, the guy was acquitted after a couple trials and then um, they charged the witness and turned it completely around on him. That case landed in our laps and we presented a third party guilt. We had pr- plenty of credible evidence to suggest that the husband did it um, because law enforcement did that for two different trials and we simply re-prosecuted him. Of course, added our own zest to it, but that was our, th- our theory of defense. Uh, didn't our guy confess? Oh, he did. So that, that did make that a little bit difficult. Wait, the friend? The friend ultimately what? <laughs> would move out of state and live his a good life, and then law enforcement reevaluated some things, retested some things, and decided to go talk to him and sent some really crackerjack jack investigators out there and put him on a polygraph oh, and got him, got him to confess. And so that was good. That was good for them. <laughs> oh, no. Bad for our guy, good for them. Um, and so, Yikes. but. What was the story? Was he like in love with her? And uh, she essentially, was there was some romance there. Ah. It was potentially unrequited. Things got heated. Yeah. Okay. Um, if you believe that he was guilty of anything, but anyway, but that is a classic example of a third-party guilt. We didn't. 
there was no question that we could go forward with that theory because we didn't just make it up. We didn't just pick a name out of a hat. Yeah, I mean, it was literally two, who, two trials worth of at least probable cause by right. by law enforcement um, to move forward against our third party guilt. So you have to have a bare minimum threshold. Right now, I would say, like, you know, we've been discussing for the purposes of a podcast and entertainment and answering viewer questions, um, Dear Emma, but there's not enough there to go after her um, unless you get some type of witness account or a search warrant comes back from DoorDash that pins her 100% there or that she rolls and cooperates in some way to exonerate herself and provide some credible credible incriminating information so you but it would it would take a lot more than what is currently there to truly have a, a defense of, you know naming somebody else you don't want to be the the defense lawyer who cried wolf and just threw something on the wall because number one the jury is going to read through it and also you lose credibility so yeah. So we've got a question. Um, do we believe that more than one person was involved? I feel like with the, I'll just go ahead and dive in. Do that. Okay. I'll let you guys, I'll, I'll stall for you guys. <laughs> um, I personally, kind of when we first started analyzing this whole situation, I did not. I thought, you know, Brian kind of dead ringer. He's got the look, as one would he's say. He's got the look. You know, maybe it's Maybelline. Maybe he's a serial killer. <laughs> I don't know. But, you know, it just everything kind of added up. And I was like, you know, his whole timeline was suspicious and his location and just, just the whole everything. I was like, it's just Brian. Now, with this introduction of Emma, maybe I'm just easily persuaded, um, kind of being introduced, I do find it all very suspicious and maybe the two of them are in some way connected um maybe this is a bigger operation than than we were led on to believe in the beginning you know with drugs being involved that does help with motive whereas brian at the time it was kind of just like well he is a serial killer and just is doing all this for the sheer societal collapse i don't know but, you know, with the drugs now introduced and kind of what we know with Emma, I don't know, maybe there's something more there and maybe somehow these two people are in a way connected. Um, but, but yeah, so maybe I'm leaning more towards possibly more than... Well, more. I think you got to think about the timeline. So we've got... Um, let's see here. we got food being delivered, delivered to Miss Kernodal at 4 a.m. And then she is also on TikTok at 4.12 a.m. So not dead yet. Not dead yet. And then there's a car driving away at a high rate of speed at 4.20. So, you know, if you you think that she's... Yeah, that that is a tight window. I mean, that's... If she is killed right after her last activity on TikTok and you're looking at seven, eight minutes... Which would be crazy. To go through a couple different levels of a house, kill four people, <clears throat> navigate other living witnesses, and get out. I was always curious about how he got in. If it's him, let's play that game, hypothetically. Because, sure, I mean, these young women maybe have been partying. Some might be intoxicated. I don't know. But you would think it would be a pretty common practice especially for young women living together to generally lock your doors now I don't know maybe I'm wrong about that but now if you're expecting a door dash order you might go to the door and just open it up now if you just if it's Kohlberger did he just get lucky and just slip in before the door was closed and door dasher walks away now or was that a way to ensure you get in if you're working with somebody or did he just get lucky and find that a door was unlocked and slid in? Because um, I don't hear any evidence of forced entry. Well, there's not. There's zero evidence of forced entry. We know that the jack-in-the-box door dash delivery got inside because there's we see the jack-in-the-box bag inside the house in the kitchen. So, and so he would either have to be going through an unlocked door or catching a door before it closed 
I mean, the other thing too is, how do you how do you plan for a DoorDash delivery? You don't, and you don't want to be. I mean, you got to be like to be waiting on a DoorDash delivery as an opportunity to enter a home. You have to kind of be hanging out there a lot. You would have to know that they party a lot, that they often order food late night. But have to you'd have to time it very specifically, right? right. And then you'd have to four a.m. They always get DoorDash on a I mean, Friday you, night. You really would have to be hanging out there a good bit and waiting on their routine to unfold as it would. Unless the DoorDash drivers are accomplice. Unless, and then that's a whole other thing. But I mean, but if you're a criminologist, Dexter, serial killer type, you don't really get lucky. Because the whole point is you're supposed to be so good and so studied that you plan a perfect murder. Well, did it show that the door, I mean, the door wasn't broken down or anything? He just walked right in? Right. But why would you even want to... Let's say you were waiting on that routine late night delivery. Well, what if... Or as, as what happens a lot with me on my DoorDash, they forget like half the order and I'm calling them back and they come right back. Like you wouldn't want to... Sponsored by Uber Eats. Right. <laughs> right. If, you, if you plan the murder, then all of a sudden DoorDash is knocking and you're interrupted. Right. Or they, they're a witness to your crime. So it's... That's a... Yeah, that's quite a huge major. I don't know what to think about that. Well, I just feel representing tons of murderers the way I do, where people charge of murderers. I don't think Koberger is the play with others type. <laughs> I, he seems like a lone wolf to me. I don't think he's going to associate with other young socialites, Insta, Instagram, uh, social media influence, and their, and their drug dealing friends. I don't think he would want to deal with that. I think he, if he did do it, he's a lone wolf. He's acting on his own, and this DoorDash thing is kind of out of the blue for him. Or he does have a stalky obsession with this house. I think on our last episode, we covered some information that potentially there's going to be some of these victims' IDs in his glove box that were later found. This was like through a leak, and maybe just a like class A stalker and. You know, wrong place, wrong time, and a, a motivated drug dealer who was short on money decided to get after it. Um, I just don't know. I just don't know. But what we do know is that Koberger apparently had zero motive, and we also know that this is a very personal, violent killing. Uh, and I will say this, talking from experience, Luke, chime in. Most violent drug dealers that we have the pleasure to represent aren't using knives. They're using guns. Mm -hmm. They're not enforcing their style of justice with a knife. As, uh, as a I means, agree with that. As a means of making sure that. that they get what they want. Most of the cases we've had involving knives actually have been women perpetrators. That's true. Um, now, I, I could... I, so that's one thing, not to... I mean, almost... Cast aspersions on any trick or sex, almost but... Almost exclusively. And a lot of time, it's a crime of opportunity. and You grab a knife in a chaotic mm -hmm. situation. Um, now, if I guess if you were a really well-planned serial killer, a knife would be good. My initial thought is because it doesn't attract witnesses by you know, gunshots in the middle of the night and instantly get neighbors and police on you. It's not, it's, it's noisy. It, other than the screams of your victims, it's not noisy. It doesn't leave behind shell casings. Yeah. So to me, it's a very smart thing if you can accomplish your goal through the use of a knife. Um, and not leave maybe your knife sheath on the crime scene. Yes, yes. Yeah, which was done. Mm -hmm. But it requires to be personally in, a, in that space with that victim, which can get you as a serial killer sustaining wounds yourself because you know they're going to be fighting, which could incriminate you. Or well, that's the whole point. You want right. the struggle. Or, or you really desire that um, to get your psychopath jollies off. So food for thought. Food for thought. I think that covers most of the questions. And again, I know we do have some um, perhaps that you had answered earlier. A lot of those questions have either been answered in previous episodes or yeah, they have been answered in previous episodes. 
So go take a listen or look if you're on YouTube um, to those episodes to get those answers. But just know, we will never discuss rule of perpetuities on this podcast. <laughs> yeah. Never. Yeah, that was not a good prank. Um, but yeah, so appreciate you guys tuning in tonight. If you have any questions or any cases that you would like to see us cover, um, feel free to send us a DM on any of our social media platforms, uh, preferably Instagram or TikTok. Um, and we would love to dive into those. We actually learned kind of about Emma Bailey and took that from our episode last week. So we really appreciate that little tip. So anything that you guys know, um, you guys are awesome and always on top of it. We'd love to hear from you and your thoughts. Um, yeah. So this was Bring the Jury. Where Bring, we the discuss- jury. Yeah, Bring the Jury. Bring the Jury. Where we discussed the Idaho Four. Um, you can always follow us on Instagram, TikTok, Facebook, LinkedIn, YouTube. Listen on any of the major streaming platforms. And if you are feeling so generous, you can also give us a donation. The link to donate is found on our social media platforms and streaming sites. We really appreciate you guys. Again, this is Luke and Brian. I'm Hannah, and we will see you all next time. Thank you. Have a good one.